So I'm immensely grateful to Professor Mitra for this invitation. Not only that, uh, I sincerely believe that, I mean, without his mentorship, having done all my degrees from India, it would have been absolutely impossible to become a faculty member somewhere in North America. So I'm always, always indebted to him. Okay, so uh, my, my, my main research focus of the group, as Dr. Mitra said, is to come up with new theories and modelings to, to explain different phenomena involving soft materials and different interfaces. I'm here today giving a talk at the Quantum Nano Center, WIN, Waterloo Institute of Nanotechnology. So I intentionally chose two such problems that have really <coughs> engrossed me and involves nanoscale surfaces. They are completely different in their scope and application. One talks about 2D materials like graphene and other van der Waals solids like hexagonal boron nitride and so on. We will only focus on graphene. And the other are, and the other is this plasma membranes, the cell membranes, the nanoscopically thick, very, very, very thin, three to five nanometer thin uh, nanoscopic membranes, plasma membranes, and the ionics of that plasma membranes. So where are these interfaces important? where, very importantly, we as mechanical engineers can think of contributing. We are not physicists who have learned these very fundamental uh, quantum mechanics in details. We are fluid mechanicians, mechanical engineer, always try to involve some uh, Navier-Stokes equation, some transport equation to understand certain physics, certain physical phenomena. And uh, there are, these are some examples where we as mechanical engineers can contribute with our knowledge on fluid mechanics, ion transport, mass transport, and so on. For example, we can contribute on nanopore DNA sequencing. This is a beautiful problem where you can pass a DNA strand through a nanopore and can measure the current depending on whether a A or a T or a C or G is passing this current decreases because you are introducing a particular non-conductive element in this nanopore. So by looking at the decrease in current, people have been doing nanopore DNA sequencing, a very, very classical technique. I won't say, well, you can say classical, but this is known for a couple of decades at least. As we are trying to understand, and this would be a key phenomenon, key part of my talk, People have been looking into the plasma membrane. So this is the plasma membrane that have this kind of protein channels through which ion passes. Why this is important? This is important. Without this, none of us would be surviving. We will not be communicating the signals between different cells. We will die. Little bit of difference creates huge, huge, huge health problems. What's going on, these protein channels that are there in this extremely impermeable plasma membranes, allow the passage of ions, allows the passage of a lot of nutrients, helps us survive, helps us uh, 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 transport signals between different cells. It is very, very important in our knees. So, so, so these two bones that you see, we can happily move because there is a beautiful polyelectrolyte layer that intervenes, and that helps to keep things lubricated. The polyelectrolyte layer with, a, with, with obviously liquid mass. Any problem with this polyelectrolyte layer leads to a lot of problems of the knees. Understanding this has been central to devising these different artificial uh, knee, knee implants and so on. And finally, the big thing of material science, 2D materials. How big? Uh, a material science is the best person to answer. <sighs> a given 2D material makes carriers. So here also there are cases where not only iron transport become important, but as more or less people are looking into it, liquid transport is also becoming important. I will start with this part of my talk. So this is a summary of some of the research areas of my, of my group. These two things are something that I am very, very interested in. Water and ions interacting with 2D materials, biomembrane electrostatics, and membrane nanoparticle interactions. <clears throat> well, 
gonna start with water and ions interacting with 2D materials. Why it is important? One of the more fascinating ideas of water filtration has come up possibly over the last six, seven, eight years, where people are looking into making filters that are few nanometers thick. It helps because thinner the thinner the membrane, less are the re flow resistance to it. We can achieve such kind of filters with extreme high specificity because of graphene and because of the fact that we can create holes in that graphene by removing bonds. So imagine you can create a hole whose dimension is less than a nanometer in a, in a system that is of the order of few nanometers. Remarkable capabilities can be attributed to this. Very well researched area, but as my research goes, I keep on challenging the existing ideas and come up with new results. We will see a lot of, lot of new challenges and new, new ideas coming in. <clears throat> the, the fact that when, you, when you, uh, you, can, you can functionalize graphene and make it charged allows you to develop this kind of a nanoscale supercapacitors. Similarly, this is something that heat transfer people really, really love is that you can make nanoscale heat conductors. You can make nanoscale surfaces which promote this kind of drop condensation rather than film condensation. Any heat transfer scientist will tell you that, ah, if I have drop condensation, we can quickly augment the, 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 the heat transfer rate. The reason is you have these drops that can be easily driven away so that it creates region for fresh heat transfer. We start with a very peculiar, I would say fascinating weighting property of graphene. Again, we do a lot of surface, uh, surface physics, we look into uh, effects of drops on surfaces, we make hydrophobic, sur we think of hydrophobic surfaces. Graphene has this remarkable, remarkable property of, or any 2D material in that matter of sense, which is called weighting translucency. Now, what is it? I will spend some time on it. Imagine <coughs> you have a system like this where you have a gold, gold I intentionally take as gold, which is very hydrophilic. Somebody say, will say 29.3 is even higher. So this is a water drop. These are some MD results from our group. This is also, this is an idea that has already been established in all these wonderful experimental papers. Uh, we try to uh, first, first revisit this. What we did, we tried to see whether we could reproduce this weighting translucency behavior. So what is it? You have a drop of water on gold that gives a very, very small contact angle. Fine. You coat that gold with a single layer of graphene, which is 0.3 nanometers, 0.4 nanometers. Put a water drop. You get a contact angle of 75, 76 degrees. You coat that gold with two layers of graphene, three layers of graphene, four layers of graphene. Your contact angle changes to 90, around 90-ish. So we have a remarkable situation where the material remains the same, contact angle changes. Why? Because the intervening solid is now changing. What do I mean? Here. The intervening solid is just one layer of graphene. So gold now can exert a Van der Waals interaction because all it has to do is to exert a Van der Waals interaction across three, three angstroms. Here, when it's two, it can exert much less. So now in this remarkable scenario, we have a single layer of graphene showing a contact angle different as compared to two layers of graphene. So as if my water is waiting translucent, waiting translucent with respect to the gold. I take up this idea and try to devise or try to conceptualize design. We are theoretician, we don't make things. Possibly my talk can motivate and interest some of you who can come forward with the experiments. We decide to look into this and see whether we can use this to make a super hydrophobic graphene. What we did? Again, we didn't do experiments. We just conceptualized. 
we are imagine I have a gold, I have a single layer of graphene and then on top of that I consider this kind of a nano pillars, a structure like this. So single layer of continuous graphene with this one layer of nano pillars. So just by this principle of weighting translucency at this location you can have a 75 degree contact angle because water is facing now one graphene supported on gold. Go back here, one, one, one graphene supported on gold, one layer of graphene supported on gold. Come here, two layers of graphene supported on gold, 90 degree contact angle. So for the first time, we can say that nano roughness, I repeat, nano roughness creates a chemical heterogeneity. There is this chemical heterogeneity that's going on. This surface or water sees this surface differently as it sees this surface in terms of the weighting translucency, right? In terms of the contact angle. So when I say chemical heterogeneity, I mean chemical heterogeneity in terms of contact angle. So imagine it is as if I have a gold surface on, on, on top of whom I have drawn two patches of two different weightabilities, right? I have coated them with two different materials. One showing an angle of 75 degree, one showing an angle of 90 degree. People do it, right? This periodic patching of like a hydrophobic, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, hydrophilic. Exactly this is what I have done. But not with two different materials, with one material and that is graphene. So if I do that, what happens? All of a sudden, I bring all the physics, all the phenomena that this kind of chemically heterogeneous surfaces bring in. And one of the key phenomena that brings, that happens when there is a chemical heterogeneity is that you get a pinning of the contact line. What happens? As the contact line of a water drop tries to traverse from this point to this point, that is, it, it, it tries to undergo this jump in waiting, it pins. It cannot follow that jump. And by that, we can achieve a contact angle of 121 degree, nearly 150 degree, and that too in a fully weighted stage. This is not a stage like this where you have this entrapped air. Here, here, this is a standard lotus leaf effect. Here is standard Cassie Baxter effect. You create pillars, you get, you get this air cavities. No, we are not doing that here. We are doing a chemical heterogeneity over here. And we, I'm oh, sorry. And we see that pinning in this video. So I bring the drop. Have a look at this contact line. This contact line moves, 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 pins. It cannot move further. So it pins on top of this junction where it has to undergo a jump in weightability. And this, this, this happens every time. We are not the first to show a contact line pinning on a chemical heterogeneous surfaces. Very well reported. We are showing it for the first time where this chemical heterogeneity is not due to two different materials, but with the same material, and that's graphene. And how? Using this weighting translucency property of graphene. <coughs> Moving on. <coughs> we now try to look into a more, I would say, experimentally realizable structure. The biggest challenge to do this experiment, you have to have this super control of having exactly one layer, exactly two layer. People do it by chemical vapor deposition, but it's not that easy. It's not that easy. The moment you cross, you have like say, okay, so that's why all of, you will see a lot of papers don't talk about mono layer of graphene. They say few layers of graphene. There's a reason for that. It's very, very, very difficult to have one layer of graphene deposit controllably. On top of that, you have to again have one layer, but this kind of a nano pillar graphene. So, yeah. So I have an experimentalist friend, this uh, Professor L. Hu, Liang Bing Hu, who said, uh, Siddhartha, let's do something that is more easily realizable experimentally. And what is that? And that's also nanostructure. And fluid mechanics is important. So he told me about this idea of something called a holy graphene. A graphene where there are, physically there are holes. People have been routinely using it because this holy graphene is pretty useful. These yellow arrows you, you see are the iron transport direction, no, no liquid. But this is pretty useful because it 
provides lot of surface area for the ion transport. And, and, and my collaborators are, are one of the experts in, in fabricating this kind of system. I tried to now look into how a, a water nano drop would behave when it interacts with this holy graphene. But a key, before understanding that, one important issue has to be understood that these holes that you see are kind of a structural defects in graphene formed by the <coughs> removal of the carbon bonds. And the moment you remove certain carbon, carbon bonds, you create an unsaturation. And the saturation is only possible by some functionalization. So these this edges of the holes that you see, they have to be either functionalized by some, they can be functionalized by some hydrophilic groups like OH, hydrophobic group, just hydrogen, or some other, other chemical compounds. We consider, again, we are, we are fluid dynamics, we are more interested with hydrophobic and hydrophilic. So we carry out experiments with hydrophilic and hydrophobic surface functionalization of this edge of the holes. <clears throat> I'm not going into details of the MD problem, but if someone is interested in it, we do explicit water model, the atomic water model, which is we use your SPCE, uh, so <clears throat> we could also do TIP4P, which is uh, distinctly better as compared to something like a Leonard Jones. So, what happens? We first apply a force on this water drop and we see how it moves. Very important, imagine we are using this holy graphene for water filtration. Very important. And we see this water transport. Apparently, very, uh, very trivial video. Yes, if you apply the force, that happens. Then we started to see, so my students came and say that, oh, Professor Das, nothing is happening. You apply a force, things are going. I asked them to calculate the total amount of mass that's going out as a function of time. And remarkably, we could identify, this has an appeared, can you, see a, can you see a very hazy rectangular box here? Hazy rectangular box here? We can, we can identify time zones where <coughs> this flux, varies with time linearly. I'm sorry, not the flux. The N, the total mass varies linearly, which, mean, which means the flux, which is dN dt, which is proportional to dN dt, N is the total number of molecules going out, that flux becomes constant. The moment you can see a flux is constant over a certain in, uh, interval of time, you think, ah, Darcy law. Can we apply Darcy law here? We tried that. We tried that. We tried to apply Darcy law. This is dN dt versus F. The proportionality constant is the permeability, right? So we, write, we tried to apply Darcy law, and we find that the Darcy law is violated for both hydrogen termination, which is a hydrophobic termination, and hydroxyl termination, which is a hydrophilic termination. And very importantly, the gradient 1.7 is for hyd hydrogen and 1.3 is for the hydroxyl. Hydrogen termination shows a higher flux. Similarly, if I look in total amount of water molecules that are going out, there is some fluctuation, but at least you can follow a trend that more amount of mass goes out for hydrogen termination. So hydroxyl termination is bad both in terms of the flux and in terms of the mass that can go out. Rate of transport of mass and the total mass transported in itself. So what is the take home message from that? This we are solving for a graphene, but this is true for possibly any nanoscale filter. And the idea is that if you have a nanoscale filter with hydrophilic properties, it is easy to wet it. You put a drop, it easily wets it but that may not be a desirable situation if you want, the, there's a, you want to have a transport through it. The wetting impedes transport. Now consider a hydrophobic system. The wetting itself becomes difficult, but if you have a critical force that can overcome that impediment created by the hydrophobicity, the flux and the mass transported can be significantly better. So there is a, there is a, there is a, there, there is a two-way traffic going on here. What you want? Somebody can even say that, wait, we want a mass, a water absorber, a nanoscale water absorber. Some water retains back. This can be perfect. 
this hydrophilic system can be perfect. Water retains back, doesn't flow out everything. You want a beautiful flow device. Hydrophobic system helps. We take this problem, again, this is, this is the research methodology of my group. I keep on telling them that, oh, wait, we can't do experiments, but we can do molecular simulation experiments. So don't throw away any results. And try to think of different permutation and combinations where new physics can evolve. So I give them a suggestion after looking at the video, hey, you are applying a force on the drop. Yes, water is going, yes. What if you apply the force, not for the entire duration of time, but a part of the time, part of its flow passage, and then you take off the force. The force is slow, so it goes down slowly. I will, I will kind of speed up the video, it goes, so force is still there. Force is still there. Now I withdraw the force. Oops, sorry, sorry. Now I withdraw the force. Oops, withdraw the force. And you see, because of capillary action, it goes, but it fails to, it fails to move the full distance. There is a, there is a beautiful science going on here, and which has a lot of applications. Oops, where is my? Okay. Just, just, just pardon. Yeah, there you go. So, you see, we get a waiting stage like, waiting state like this. It's a very, very fascinating waiting stage. I have encapsulated the graphene layers. You can relate this to something like this. Take a fiber. Very easy. Take a take a passing like take a, take take one of your old shirts. Some some threads hanging out. Dip it in a water. Look into that. You will see this beautiful water drop, encapsulating the whole fiber. The drop on a fiber, as if these graphene stacks are acting as my fiber, where I've encapsulated it with the water. What its use? Its use is. We now measure the total surface area. We now measure the total surface area of weighted graphene. We measure the total surface area of the weighted graphene. And I compare that with a non holy graphene where we have used the same volume of water. I have created a holy graphene architecture. I have a non holy graphene. And we take their ratios. We see that their ratios, depending upon the nature of termination, can be nearly two times or even more. What you do with that ratio? Why that ratio is important? Imagine I am looking for a heat transfer device I, uh, that I would use, I would like to use this graphene system as a, in a heat exchanger. I want <coughs> maximum exposure of this graphene. I want maximum exposure of this graphene to water. This enables it. Holy graphene was known for providing larger surface areas to ions. This research says that holy graphene under right combination of the applied force and so on can also lead to a large exposed area for water. So whenever any interface where Interaction between graphene and water is important. That can be in forming electric double layer capacitors. That can be in heat transfer. This mechanism can be very, very useful. Okay. <clears throat> Our original idea was to see whether we could use this kind of a holy graphene for a more optimized water filtration. So when I talk of filtration, I need to filter some moieties. One of the most things are the ions, desalination. So we carried out some simulations where we were trying to look into how sodium and chlorine ion in a water drop moves. So I don't know whether you can see the, there is a blue ion here. The blue is a sodium that is getting attracted to a, this is a hydrophobic termination. and there is this yellow, can you see a yellow here? This yellow is a chlorine. So I am trying to understand how 
this sodium and chlorine are interacting with this water and, and, and how it interacts with graphene. So, as, as we are trying to write a paper out of it, we said that wait, look, there are different interfaces here. The, the, the most important interface to start with would be the air water interface and how ions interacting with that air water interface. <coughs> more, uh, more naively, how ions interact and adsorb at air water interface. Classical, classical, classical problem. We kind of thought all the results are there, has to be. So, it has been problem studied for nearly 100 years. We started to sense a bit fishy when we found that even in 2017, people are writing PNAS just studying the ion adsorption at air water interface. Huge number of publication. Does it mean science is still not absolutely established? I feel it, it's Newton's law. It's as simple as Newton's law. Everybody understands it. So we looked into possibly the work that's, that closely resembles us. It was looking into the interaction of an iodide ion with an air water interface. And this work by <coughs> uh, a group from UC Berkeley, they tried to make these conclusions. They said that there are that as ion goes to the air water interface, it suppresses the capillary waves. So what are capillary waves? If you go to air water interface, because of thermal energy, there are waves, right? So ion goes there and, and as it goes there, it kinds of pins the or suppresses the capillary waves. So any suppression leads to a decrease in entropy, right? So the decrease in entropy means if you write the free energy, Again, mechanical engineers are happy to write this beautiful thermodynamic free energy, simple free energy equation. Delta G <coughs> gives energy, gives free energy, minus T delta S is there. So if, if T delta, so if delta S is negative, this is a positive, so delta G it becomes unfavorable. Very simple. So you must need something that favors it. So what favors it? They proposed and showed, showed with certain results that what is favored is nothing but the enthalpy or the or the internal energy because they, they, they felt that there was no PV work. So without any PV work, enthalpy is same as the internal energy change. And that enthalpy decreases, so delta H or delta U become negative and why? Because as the ion goes to the interface, it displaces the surface water to the bulk and the bulk, in, in the bulk, the water are more stabilized as they can form stable bonds with other water molecules. Okay. State of the art, message complete. I said, my students, okay, hey, the results are there. Then one of my very, very brilliant PhD student comes up and said, Professor Das, I think there's an error. I said, come on. And these are, this paper is in PNS. There are three, four followed up papers that cites this work, supports this work. They said, wait, wait. They look into a simulation box you see here is 20 angstroms. So this, these numbers are in nanometers, look in the x, so x and y, y is in this direction, so x is 20 angstrom. I said, what's the problem with that? He said that it's well established, not by people doing ions, but people trying to understand capillary waves better, that capillary waves needs minimum of, a uh, minimum, a simulation box of 10 sigma, where sigma is the atomic dimension, molecular dimension, for water, it's around 3.1 angstrom. So we need to have a minimum of 31 angstroms, minimum. So we carried out experiments with uh, uh, simulations with much larger simulation box, more than 50 angstrom. And we got just the opposite result. The work is, again, the work is just submitted. We got completely opposite result. We showed that if you bring the ion to the interface, capillary waves, fluctuations of the capillary waves are enhanced. The greens are the one, the green dots are 67 angstrom means 67 angstrom from the bottom of the interface that is at the in bottom of the surface that is at the interface. And the blue are at the bulk that is 57 angstroms. I said, no, 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 it is, it is incorrect. You repeat your simulation for smaller box size. He said, yes, I would do that. And we repeated the simulation for the smaller box size, smaller simulation box size. And 
we got same qualitative thing that the previous pre-NASH papers got. Yes, if you have a small box size, the capillary waves, you see, these are the capillary wave fluctuations. Z equal to 21 is now the interface location. Z equal to 15 is the bulk location. So the capillary wave fluctuations with iron, so, so these, are the, these are the iron positions, with the iron at the bulk, capillary fluctuations at the iron at the bulk are much more as compared to iron at the interface. So yes, this whole conclusion that iron at the interface suppresses the capillary waves and which has been the kind of the pivotal point in explaining the different energetics of iron adsorption breaks down. We carried out further and we tried to analyze what is happening to the wave characteristics? Because now we cannot sell this idea that delta S, the entropy, goes down because of capillary wave suppression. Capillary wave fluctuations are not suppressed in our case. It's enhanced. So we decided to decide that, wait, look, we have to now give a new energetic understanding. And how we start? We look, we did a wave construction. We do a surface construction of the waves. And this A chi is nothing but the total area of that enhanced capillary waves with the iron at the interface. And we find, as we decompose it into modes, that with the iron, with the iron at the interface, this is the iron at the interface, the, the mode with the smallest wave number or the largest wavelength dominates. Physically, you can understand like this. Imagine, I have an interface, I have an iron. It goes, it goes, it goes, it locally deforms it. Let's say this is my interface, iron has locally deformed it, locally. What system would like to do? System would like to minimize the deformation or minimize the effect and what and how it will do? It will do so that it can do that with the least energy expenditure and that least energy expenditure is possible if the system generates a wave with maximum wavelength to overcome it. Quick understanding can be understood from here. So see here, this iron, this in, in, in yellow, is kind of locally deformed this interface. So I would now like to have a wave that kind of nullifies this deformation. But if you take too little size of the simulation box, that you cannot generate the maximum possible wave. You are compressing it. So if you moment you push it down, you can get the maximum wave that you are looking for. And we did not repeat the results. We kept on increasing the size of the simulation box beyond up to a certain point, up to I think we could go up to uh, I think 10 or 12, 12, 12 nanometer, 120 angstrom. And every time the number slightly varies, but the qualitative conclusion remains identical. So now we try to understand the certain contribution of this particular wave characteristics. We plotted the pressure. And we found that the, because of the fact that you have a uniform wave with the iron at the interface, the pressure fluctuations go down. Anybody will tell you that if you have a curved surface, a uniform curve like this, flat curve, your R goes up. And as your R, your effective radius of curvature goes up, your pressure comes down, right? On the other hand, imagine a scenario where you have lot of fluctuations, lot of fluctuation not given by a single mode that happens with the iron at the bulk, the pressure fluctuations are much more. So with the iron at the interface, the pressure goes down. The volume doesn't show that much of change, but this pressure going down, you get a very negative contribution of delta P. That means delta PV is now supporting the iron adsorption. Right, because delta H is delta U plus delta PV. So if delta PV becomes negative, you can see because of this negative effect of delta PV, your delta H also becomes negative. So despite a very large, very unfavorable internal energy, your overall enthalpy becomes negative. Because of this, de decreased pressure volume, delta, de large negative delta PV. <coughs> we also study the <coughs> the overall gives energy change and overall delta H. Delta H is explained. Problem happens, what is happening with the minus T delta S? So minus T delta S is still positive, that is unfavorable, right? But 
capillary waves are not suppressed. So, what is making delta S negative or minus T delta S positive? We infer and we establish mathematically, not shown here, the fact that in the with the ion at the interface you have a large wavelength, you are not <clears throat> you are not mixing the modes. You are no longer mixing the different modes. You have a one mode and you are staying with that mode. And as you do that, you lower the mixing entropy. So what you see here is that entropy is going, <coughs> sorry, your entropy is going down, minus T delta S is becoming positive, not because of suppression, but because of lowering of mixing of entropy. The, the modes, the different modes no longer mix anymore. Or the, the, uh, the mixing is much less because you have only mode of only one large wavelength, right? You don't have different modes in with the ion at the interface. So here's a quick summary of, of, of what the state of the art, and so you see these are all PNAS papers. As Professor Mitra said at the out, outset that controversy, yes there is controversy, and these are very, 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 very big people, we are challenging them, we don't know what happens. Hopefully my career is not ruined. So they said, Ion at air water interface suppresses the capillary waves. We say ion at interface enhances the capillary waves. They say favorable negative enthalpy change is associated to the ion at interface induced redistribution of water from interface to bulk. We say this favorable enthalpy change is associated to the lowering of the PV work dictated by the structure of the particular structure of the capillary waves. They said that the un uh, <coughs> sorry, unfavorable negative entropy change is associated to the suppression of the capillary waves. We said no, the unfavorable or the negative entropy change is associated to the lowering of the mixing entropy due to the predominance of a single mode for ion at interface. There is a single mode that is dictating the capillary waves with the ion at interface that reduces the mixing entropy. And that is the reason, it's not the suppression of the capillary waves, it's the reduction of the mixing of entropy. So these are the <clears throat> these are the these are the these are the things that we we propose. In one year's time, we will know the output and the output. Okay, so here's a quick summary of the first part of my talk, where I discuss about the interaction of water and ions with the with the with the two D materials like graphene. We came up and showed that we could use wetting translucency property of graphene to generate this kind of beautiful atomistically thin superhydrophobic graphene. <coughs> We demonstrated that there can be a possible breakdown of Darcy's law as you, as you transport water through that holy graphene. We could also generate very large augmented water accessible graphene surface areas by manipulating and controlling the forces with which the water is driven. And finally, we revisited and tried to understand the framework of ion adsorption at air water interface. Of course, this work is not directly related to any of water, any of graphene, but the connection is since we are starting to look into water ion interaction with graphene, we stumbled upon this extremely interesting and controversial problem. In the last part of the talk, I think uh, we, have, we have how much? 15 minutes? Yeah. So, in the last 15 minutes of my talk, I will talk about a completely different completely different type of system sorry completely different types of systems different types of systems where i will be talking about again water and ion becomes important but from 2d material i jump onto something called the plasma membrane the cell membranes so <clears throat> here is a pictorial demonstration of my plasma membranes it is formed of lipid bilayers and it has this kind of protein channels where through which this kind of and these are some surface proteins and these protein channels helps in ion, ion absorb this, this ion transport and some of the surface protein acts as receptors when we want to target this particular plasma membrane with certain nanoparticles. Very, very important part of my talk. <coughs> where we come from here? This is a biophysical problem. This is a problem of biophysicists. Biophysics, very, very, very important problem. Where, where we come here into this, into this whole story as a mechanical engineer? We are mechanics people. We like to love to solve a mechanics problem. Mechanics means forces, energies, and so on. A very, very classical problem has been to see 
how a nanoparticle interacts with this plasma membrane. Why very important? Nanoparticle, targeted drug delivery, targeted drug delivery for cancer treatment, and what not, what not, what not. So we are, I looked into the literature and said that when, when, when one of my PhD students started and said that, did people look into the effect of surface charges? And the fact that the membrane is very, very highly charged, it often can be as charged as 0.1 or 0 0.05 minus 0.1 or minus 0 0.5 coulomb per meter square, very, very charged. And there is very large ion concentration of the order of uh, nearly 100 millimolar or even more around both in the cytoplasm, this is the cyto cytoplasm, intracellular part and the extracellular part. So I, I asked my graduate student to look into the fact that if people have looked into the effect of the surface charge in this nanoparticle membrane interaction, he couldn't find a single paper. Not a single paper that talks about how this ion distribution, how these charges of a membrane affect membrane nanoparticle interaction. Ah, voila, we have something to work on. Problem happened. These are, these are some of the applications. I'm, I'm, I'm cutting it a bit short because of matter of time. I want to show some interesting results. See, we have already talked about this, some signal transaction, nanoparticle targeted drug delivery. So what we will say we would do, we will serve as a bridge between two communities. One community that talk, very, very famous people from Professor Hua Jin Gao, Reinhard Leposki, very, very famous people who looked into the mechanics of nanoparticle membrane interaction, and very, very other group of famous people who looked into ions in soft systems, like Professor Martin Bazan, Professor Juan Santiago of Stanford, Professor Vinogradova, and so on. So we are trying to look into this kind of a setting, where this is my plasma membrane. I have two surfaces, negatively charged, you have two kinds of double layer. This is an example where the membrane is fully permeable, permeates both the ions from the electrolyte side to the cytosol side, both plus and minus. Example where this, this system of plus and minus ion permeates only plus ion, so it's a semi-permeable membrane. We said that, okay, it must be known. Electrostatics of this must be known. People may have not done the nanoparticle interaction, but the electrostatics of this classical problem must be very, very well known. So we said, okay, let's re-derive the, re the equations. We did, we did derive the equations. We are looking mostly in the semi-permeable case. That's more interesting. And we tried to get a match between what a uh, uh, recent, oh, sorry, sorry. What a recent study did, okay, what a recent study did and what we are doing. So this, this markers is from this recent simulation study by Professor Vinogradova, and we did this uh, analytical solution. We are seeing that Vinogradova did for an infinite thin membrane. So if we decrease the thickness of the membrane, as you can see, we nicely match the results. But I come from a background where who, are, who is very interested to look into the ion distribution on charged surfaces. The first thing that struck me is this beautiful profile. What is so beautiful in this profile? See here, here I have a negative surface, the membrane, but here I get a positive potential. I have a scenario where a negative surface triggers a, pos triggers a positive potential far away from it. A negatively charged surface triggers a positive potential far away from it. Where we see this classically? This is seen in something known as <coughs> charge inversion effect. You take a nano channel or you take a simple surface, you are measuring this electric double layer of ions, and you add a lot of multivalent counter ions. Like negatively charged surface, you add a lot of aluminum 3 plus ions, large concentration of calcium 2 plus ions. You will see that after a certain distance from the negative charge, negative charge, you get positive potential. That's because ion ion interaction, ion ion correlation effect set in for this multivalent counter ions, and you get that. We are seeing something very similar, but with particular counter ion. The reason is you have now developed a remarkable scenario of counter ion only EDL. Because of semi permeability, you have developed a counter ion only EDL. You solve this simple equation, simple, simple one dimensional equation with right boundary condition, and you get this. 
I told my students, okay, let's play with the parameters. He started playing with them. We found that as we, as we increased, <coughs> sorry, as we increase the, as we increase the salt concentration and we kind of decrease the charge density of the membrane, this location where this inversion sets in, that is where the shy becomes zero and changes from negative to positive, that is coming closer and closer and closer and closer to the membrane, eventually giving rise to a remarkable scenario where the surface itself becomes positively charged. You have for the first time somebody is seeing a positively charged plasma membrane, sorry, I withdraw my words, uh, somebody is seeing a negatively charged plasma membrane showing a positive zeta potential. I know only one, one material, one well-known material that shows such a weird behavior and that's glass. Because of certain chemical equilibrium condition, you can have a scenario where you're, for a glass, your zeta potential is positive and your sigma is negative for a certain pH dependent situation. You can have that for glass. Again, here is no pH dependence or anything. It's just because of this peculiar nature of this ion distribution happening because on a semi-permeable side, you get this charge inversion at the membrane charge interface, oh, sorry, membrane cytosol interface. You get this negative charge. You can see here, this is a membrane location where you have created this, 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 this negative potential. This becomes even stronger over here. You have a positive potential on a negatively charged surface. Enough of electrostatics, I have maybe six, 10 minutes, 10, five 10, minutes. yeah, five minutes. I will quickly wrap up some of very, very interesting results that we are now using this electrostatics to understand nanoparticle interactions. Nanoparticle interactions are very, very well known to, develop, to deliver drugs for a large, large number of body parts. They can be cells, they can be organs, and so on. Very recently, something very interesting came up. And these are reported in some of these recent papers that if you have a one-dimensional nanoparticle, they call it a discoidal nanoparticle, this nanoparticle, it is much more efficient than spherical nanoparticle in, in, in getting transported and to the particular organ or remaining retained in the organ. And they say the reason is, again, this has to be proven through detailed mathematics that these discoidal nanoparticles align more easily with the blood flow. So we work with a 1D nanoparticle. So the, what's the whole idea of this non-specific, of, of this targeted drug delivery? Imagine I have these red cells with our disease cells, infected cells, in a host of healthy cells which are blue. You want this nanoparticle to be specifically driven and adhered or, and get, a, get adsorbed or adhered to this infected cells without, happy, without having this scenario where they go and hit the normal healthy cells. <laughs> And how this specific interaction happens, you design, this is, imagine this is my nanoparticle, you design a particular ligand, engineer with a ligand that interacts specifically with that receptor protein on the membrane surface, which is expressed specifically on the infected cells, and that interaction never happens with this kind of cells, so it can interact and go in. <coughs> we try to see first, how a gold nanoparticle, bare gold nanoparticle, would interact through the receptor ligand interaction. So the moment I introduce a bare gold nanoparticle, you see in this blue curve, the electrostatic potential in the system changes. Why? Because now this gold, which cannot support a charge, is introducing a new boundary condition to the system. Okay, we solved for the electrostatics, and then we tried to say that, how would we decide that this interaction would take place? Somebody says, oh, don't worry, there would be, there would be uh, receptor ligand interaction. People have stopped there. I asked them a question. Wait, wait. Now, you have a scenario where you have a negative charged membrane and a negatively charged gold. They will repel each other, right? Negatively charged membrane, negatively charged gold. You have triggered a negative potential on the surface of the gold. They will repel each other, right? How will they come close to each other? And you can see the overall force or overall parameter. I can define a parameter R, which is a ratio of two things. One, 
it is the electrostatic energy which depends on the disjoining pressure and it is a so this is the repulsive effect the repulsion between the gold nanoparticle and the membrane which is countered by the attractive van der Waals effect and the thermal energies. So, I am now looking into the variation of R. So, the whole idea is if R remains less than 1 throughout I would have beautiful interaction, but what happens if R becomes more than 1. So, I plot R as a function of the distance of separation between the membrane and 1D nanoparticle, gold nanoparticle for different system parameters and we find that yes, there are possibilities where R becomes more than 1. So, here is the nanoparticle approaching, here is my membrane, here is my nanoparticle approaching it, R becomes more than 1 at certain at these separation distances. What does it mean? It means that if I have to at all ensure there is a receptor ligand interaction, this receptor ligand interaction must happen at a location that is at such a distance where R remains less than 1. That is, if I have this parameters corresponding to this blue curve, it has to be over here, it has to be over here, it cannot be over here. So, in that way, based on the electrostatic environment of the system, we can now provide a formula, we can now provide a design parameter for designing the ligands on the nanoparticle and that we call as the receptor ligand length DRL which is dictated by the ligand length and so the condition for the adhesion under that situation is this DRL should be greater than this DGC1 where this DGC1 refers to that critical separation distance where R is equal to 1 and for DG for the separation distance less than DGC1 R becomes more than 1 and we cannot work. So, this is a pictorially this is approaching nanoparticle getting attracted if DRL is greater than DGC1 yes it will have an interaction but if DRL is less than DGC1, it will be repelled back. We get, we devise a condition for the specific adhesion in terms of electrostatics. I would like you to focus on this curve, on this particular plot. It is in small, sorry, this, this green curve. Why is this green curve is important? This is the scenario where most of the cells exist. Point minus point 0.1 electron per nanometer square, charge density, large salt concentration. You see R is always less than 1. Ah, I am happy. I have specific interaction. I do not have to worry. Problem is this would mean I will always have a non-specific interaction as well. This is true for healthy cells. The moment this is true for healthy cells, there is no mechanism to prevent the nanoparticle coming and hitting the membrane non-specifically. So, this will be delivered to the healthy cells. One of the biggest, biggest, biggest problems of this chemotherapy, the healthy cells get affected. I am not going into these details of this calculation, but we now try to, this is the last thing I will say. So, we now try to propose a mechanism by which we can ensure two things simultaneously using electrostatics. One, we can have one a specific addition and two, we can prevent a non-specific addition simultaneously. So, we know the condition of the specific addition. What is it? DRL, the receptor ligand length has to be greater than the DGC1, that is the cutoff distance where R becomes more than 1. How do we ensure that under physiological condition, that condition that, that I just showed, you get a R, so, so problem of this condition is you have for physiological condition R remaining less than 1. How you can have R more than 1? We try to see the different materials that people talk of they are not sufficiently negative. How can you have a sufficiently negative nanoparticle which is not that harmful? One idea is to have this remarkable idea that people are now working on called biomimetic nanoparticle. You take a nanoparticle and you coat it with a cell membrane. That cell membrane can come from a red blood cell, other plasma membrane. People have looked into this not in terms of electrostatic, but but in kind of <coughs> overcoming and suppressing your immune system. Biggest problem of adding a nanoparticle, your, your immune system flares up. 
they hate new things over there. So, so people are trying to look into this kind of a scenario where the immune system cannot recognize a new nanoparticle if you coat it with something by which cells are coated, the cell membranes. So we imagine such kind of a system. Well, there is a, this blue thing, so I don't know, maybe this is not clear. There is a blue thing on a, and so I have a gold nanoparticle coated with this membrane, which is, which is in blue. And this membrane is as negatively charged as the membrane itself, obviously. And this is what we achieve under the physiological condition. So even at the, under the physiological condition now, we have a scenario where R becomes 1 at some point, that is you have a finite DGC1. You can always design a receptor ligand length that is larger than the DGC1 that will ensure a specific addition. But the very fact that you have a DGC1 would mean there will not be any non-specific addition. So you can simultaneously prevent not only, you can simultaneously ensure a prevention of non-specific addition and a promotion of specific addition. And that too with a material that is kind of a bio-friendly if I may say so. Okay. <clears throat> so quick summary of my key findings from this part of the talk. We have discovered a very non-intuitive situation where the plasma membranes demonstrate a positive zeta potential despite having a negative surface charge density. We have developed this electrostatically motivated design of the receptor ligand lens. The th this third point we, I didn't get time to discuss. And finally, we have proposed how these biomimetic nanoparticles use electrostatics to simultaneously promote specific addition and prevent non-specific addition. So I would like to acknowledge my collaborator, particularly on the graphene work, Professor Peter Chung, my graduate students, and my former Emma student Joseph, who was keenly responsible for setting up the MD work and the funding agency, US Department of Energy, uh, two separate grants from NIH and two institute, NCI and NHLBI. And also, uh, this is a local, this is there's something internal, which, is, uh, which helped me start my initial results with, with, with MD work. And this, and I'm grateful to this very high speed supercomputer, Deep Thought 2, that is there at University of Maryland. This is a group photo from, I think, uh, Joseph's Defense, which was two years back. The group has become twice this size now. Thank you, and I would like to love to have your questions. Yeah. This, which graph you're talking? Uh, the one showing the okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. This one will. Okay. One D problem, yeah. Electrostatic potential is very simply related to the charge distribution. Right, right, right. All right. Um, so you're saying there's no electric field inside the membrane? No, no, no. I didn't say that. No, but inside the membrane. So yeah, inside the membrane. No, no. There's there's an electric field, but inside the membrane, there is no net charge density. So I will go to the equation. Yeah. So inside, this is inside the membrane. So the membrane doesn't hold a charge. Sure. Hmm? The slope is not zero. Right. So uh, the slope becomes equal to zero for a fully permeable membrane. And that's, and that's because it, it's a symmetry now. So if you have a symmetry, it will become straight line. No, liquid field is the slope. Right, right, right. But I'm saying slope is also zero for a fully permeable membrane. For an impermeable membrane, it is not zero. You could see there is a, there is a curve. You could see. This is, this is the membrane location. Yeah, well, let's go back to the other one. Which one? Yeah, so this is, this is, it depends on the system parameters. If, if you have chosen, it depends again. So here I'm doing a fully, so, it's, so you can see it is less, it gradually grows up. It depends on the system parameters, how you choose the system parameters. It's a function of the system parameters. The place where the slope should be zero mm -hmm. is where you have, there will be a dividing surface where on one side you'll have an equal number of positive and negative, right. and on the other side it'll be equal. Right, right. So, no, no, no. This is this is non-zero. Um, this is since we are plotting on the same thing. If you if you zoom it in here, this is non-zero. <laughs> okay. Where okay. is the zero then? Right. Where? At the surface? No, the zero is at the at the at the boundaries. There should be a boundary. Or a boundary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the boundary. Yeah. But, but. No, there should be a plane somewhere. Yeah. Where there is equal neg amount of negative charge and positive charge on each side. And there, the electric field should be zero. And it's it's over here. It's over here. Everything is zero. No, no. That's 
Yeah, it's over here. Yeah, there's also a plus right, minus infinity. Right, right, right. Somewhere in between, there should also be a minus minus. Provided you are minus assuming. Ah, things are not charge neutral. I mean, the total amount of. Oh, yeah. Things are not charge neutral. You are looking into an electric double layer. Ion distribution in electric double layer is not charge neutral. If I can use the board, I don't know. So. Membrane have count yeah counter ions make it charge non neutral. The space charge is charge non neutral. Charge neutrality comes if you consider the electric double layer and the membrane charge together. Right. Right? Yeah. Okay. So, so if you consider the membrane charge and the electric double layer together, then you get a charge neutral. You do not get a charge neutrality in the shy. Shy is the so, so the whole charge neutrality comes if you consider the integral of psi plus sigma. Sigma is the membrane surface charge. Yeah. The charge neutral is the whole system. People keep on making this mistake. Electric double layer is not charge neutral. It cannot be charge neutral. Charge neutral is the charge surface plus the electric double layer. Two things taken together. So if I have integrated this psi okay. and plus I taken a sigma, do one thing, you integrate the psi over y, you add that plus 2 sigma here, which is the membrane surface charge, you get a charge neutrality. So if you go to the cartoon above, huh? at what value of y, no, the cartoon, yeah, mm -hmm. what value of y do you think the electric field is zero? What value of y over here? Like, I mean, as you come in, uh -huh. far away the electric field is zero. Yeah. As you some positive charges now. Right, right, here. right. Here is here yeah, electric field is non-zero here. Yeah. Non-zero, non-zero. Then, then you go large distance away, electric field is zero, where the membrane is no longer exerting its influence. Okay. Yeah. I'll leave that. yeah. Any other questions? Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so the charge neutrality that you have here. Right, right, right. Right, right. So you assume something, then based on, for example, your water permission, huh. water permeability. Right, right. So, so you assume the water how interface each other, and the water how interface with the interface. Mm -hmm. Make some assumption. Right. Then you do the calculation. Right, right. And to get the, to get these uh, results. I mean, for the MD, we do not have to do too much assumptions. Yes, we have to keep an, for example, for the MD, we do an assumptions with the MD of the graphene. We assume that the graphenes don't show up, I mean, like uh, fluctuations. So we say that the carbon atoms remain in their place, which is not strictly correct. There is kind of a wave that, a, quant a kind of a polariton wave that's going on. So, so all this assumption, you think is correct? That make you very confident on your results? Uh, all, all these are, the point is, uh, I kind of look into this. I try to make the assumptions that are that make sense, and from there I attempt to address a problem as the first go at it. Are you going to do experiments? <laughs> uh, I, do, I have a big experimental program on 3D printing, but for to do experiments on this, somebody has to give money to me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have we are trying to look into some people from Harvard Medical School who are who are interested in some of this some of this uh, uh, plasma membrane work and trying to look into some vesicle interactions. In terms of the graphene, we my collaborator is an experimentalist, but again, I mean he is less interested in the fundamentals and more interested in the applied version. So I have to come up with a problem statement where he feels very excited that there is a big application potential rather than just looking into more fundamental water interaction with graphene. So, that is, so that's, that's what I said at the very outset. So if, if I can uh, uh, kind of interest people here to do some experiments on this kind of topics, I will feel very grateful. Any other last question? Yes. Yes. Uh, so the force has been uh, considered as a repulsive in your... Uh, no, attractive. attractive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. So this repulsive is the electrostatic interaction because you have two negatively charged systems, which is countered by a 
attractive components. So attractive components is the van der Waals. And we take the ratio of the repulsive by attractive and see where this ratio becomes less than one and more than one. Right. So like in the, the material, like in the, you use gold, right? Versus you use uh, like silicon, mm -hmm. uh, the Vanderbilt's force. Absolutely. Like and that has been absolutely accounted for. So it has been accounted for through the Hamaker constant. So we have carefully, for example, the, this, this problem first considers the gold and the membrane. So gold membrane interaction has one Hamaker constant. Similarly, when we come here, so this, oh, sorry, this problem, when we do this, here we are doing a Hamaker constant between two membranes, right. like a plasma membrane or a lipid bilayer, lipid bilayer. So do you have like a, uh, some idea like how does this distance change between the gold or uh, another particle and the lipid the membrane? Uh, distance of the Hamaker constant, what uh, is changed? As a function, uh, basically it's a Van der Waals force, right? As a function right. of, of distance. Right, right, right. Of course, of course I know. So for example, uh, if you have a plasma membrane, plasma membrane, Hamaker constant is nearly 20 times less as compared to gold plasma membrane. So gold plasma membrane attraction is much more. Nearly, so if I remember the numbers correctly, for the gold, for the gold plasma membrane, the Hamaker constant is around 25 times 10 to the power minus 21 joules. Whereas this one is around 5 to, no, maybe 2 to 3 or 4 to 5. So five times, no, not 20, five times. Uh, so, so five times less, less. So what will happen with the, with the gold plasma membrane, the attraction is stronger because Hamaker potential is larger. Yeah. The Hamaker constant is larger. What, what I want to tell you is now basically, if you change the distance by like 0.1 angstrom, uh -huh. right? so 0.1 angstrom, nothing will happen. Yeah. So typically of the order of one nanometer, yes. 0.1 angstrom is like, 0.01 nanometer, that's too small. Van der Waals interaction length scale is around one nanometer. So you take one nanometer, 1.1, 1.2. So as you being closer, the gold and the plasma membrane interaction would show larger increase as compared to a plasma membrane, plasma membrane interaction. Okay, uh, let's thanks uh, to Bob again.